Alright guys, welcome back to the video on nutrition improvements. Actually, it's the last video already. Congrats, you have survived the entire chapter. Okay, but um, this is actually the shortest video as well, I think. Okay, so uh, we have already went through quite a bit in the previous few videos. Uh, mainly, just to sum up, we talk about ingestion, we talk about digestion, we talk about absorption. So this next part of the video, we're actually going to talk about how assimilation takes place to allow all these food substances to be made for better use. But uh, before we start off, I thought it would be good if you can take a look at this video so that you can learn something from it. Predator and prey are constantly in an evolutionary arms struggle for survival. But then, there's another lesser known arms race underway between the more peaceful members of the animal kingdom. This is the battle of digestive systems. Two opponents make use of two different strategies to extract nutrients from available food. Giraffe, buffalo and wildebeest are all ruminants, meaning they have very sophisticated digestive systems that can exploit every last drop of nutrients in their food. But to ruminate is a very drawn-out process. Food is chewed, swallowed, regurgitated and chewed again to break it down for optimal absorption. In this way, every bite is maximized. Zebra, on the other hand, are non-ruminants or hindgut fermenters, as are elephants and rhinos. The digestive systems of non-ruminants work differently to ruminants. They can't extract every bit of energy out of their food by chewing and rechewing it, but they can get the energy that is released out more quickly. Alright, so in this lesson, right, we're actually going to learn about what I call the hepatic powder bin. Okay, we're going to talk about this process called assimilation. And in the end, we're just going to talk a bit about some of the problems that comes along with excessive consumption of alcohol. So what happens after nutrients are absorbed? Basically, after the absorption of nutrients, right, assimilation should take place. Because once nutrients go into the blood, right, it should be used for some purposeful functions. Like. It shouldn't be just flowing through the entire bloodstream. So assimilation is a process whereby some of the absorbed food substances are used to either convert into the new protoplasm, which are um, structures for the cells, okay, or it can be used to provide energy. Okay, so this is just something to take note of. So one key thing to take note of is that after the small intestine absorbs, this is the small intestine, huh? okay, after it absorbs all the nutrients, you take note that there will be a main uh, vein that actually moves out from the small intestine, which is represented by this blue structure here, which I am shading now, that I call the hepatic portal vein. Now this is a very, very important vessel. Now what's so important about this is that it actually helps to collect and unite all the nutrients of the sugar as well as amino acids the sugar in the sense of glucose huh? because glucose is absorbed in the small intestine it actually brings all these things to the liver and at the liver that's when the magic happens because the liver will help to arrange or organize the nutrients that's inside so as to make sure that not too much goes back into the entire body so for the glucose that's being absorbed okay, what happens is that once it enters into the, the liver sorry once it enters the liver, right, what could have happened is that the hepatic power will bring the glucose to the liver and then if there's too much glucose, for instance, if you drink a lot of coke or soft drinks or you eat a meal that's very heavy in carbohydrate, there'll be a lot of glucose in your blood. To make sure that this blood that's, uh, being, uh, uh, that's at the small intestine, right, when it brings the blood to the liver, to make sure that you don't spread the sugar around in that body, whereby you'll end up getting diabetes, right, what your liver does it's really amazing that it actually converts all this glucose into what I call glycogen and then it stores it inside the liver. And this process is required by the help of a hormone that's called insulin. Yeah? And the remaining glucose, so basically inside the liver, right, the glucose will actually be converted into glycogen. The extra glucose will be converted and will be stored there. The remaining one will then be allowed to go through. What I call the hepatic vein, and it brings the glucose to the rest of our body. And the rest of our body, glucose will eventually be used as an energy source for the cells to release energy for whatever function that it needs. Okay. So this is how the body has to keep in check the nutrients that is absorbing, and this is what I call assimilation. So the absorbed glucose will go into the liver. If there's too much glucose, the liver will control it by converting it into glycogen, releasing the excess, uh, re releasing the remaining glucose out into the rest of our body. Now, for the amino acids that are being absorbed, 
Likewise, the hypertic powder vein will be the one that brings the nutrients to the liver. It's a portal vein, just so you know. Lah. Okay. So, excess amino acids in the liver will actually be converted into what I call urea. So, if there's too much amino acids in your diet, for example, you eat too much meat, right? It will actually be, so because you too many a lot of protein, when it's digested, it forms a lot of amino acids. This amino acid will actually be formed into urea, and it will be used uh, subsequently for uh, other processes. Okay, and the remaining amino acids will be transported by the hip heavy veins to the rest of the body to be used maybe to build muscles, to repair different structures. Okay, so there's also a checkpoint. You think of it as like you're going to Malaysia, you need to cross the checkpoint, right? Before you can cross the checkpoint, there must be some processes there to make sure that you need to allow the correct things to move through, but not too much. In fact, urea, the one that I mentioned just now, that's formed from amino acids from this process called deamination. It actually is the one that eventually results in the very strong smell that you smell wherever you put it in the toilet to pee. Okay. Urea is one of the chemicals that will actually uh, turn into something else that gives us a very, very smelly smell. We call it a pungent smell. Okay. So your urine will contain urea itself. You can sit through this part. Okay. The liver actually plays a very key role in assimilation. Not just that, but it also does other functions. Okay, so the liver can help to regulate blood glucose concentration. What do I mean by that? If there's too much glucose, okay, the liver can actually change it into glycogen. Okay, if there's too little, it can convert glycogen back to glucose. It also does other functions like making protein, deamination of proteins, production of bowel, as well as detoxification. So you can look at each of them briefly. First and foremost, the reason like what I mentioned just now, why don't you get diabetes straight after you drink a can of coke? This coke actually contains a lot, a lot of sugar. The reason is because the liver helps to keep the blood glucose concentration constant. How does it do so? It actually plays around with two particular hormones. One is called insulin, one is called glucagon. Okay, and it helps to store and release gluco uh, glucose respectively. Okay. There's no need to worry too much about this concept because we'll eventually come back to this when we're in sec 4. So just, just to give you an example, if there's too much glucose in the blood, the liver will convert the glucose into glycogen and the blood glucose level will go back to normal. Okay, so it will decrease instead of rising up. But if there's too little glucose in the blood, what happens is that the liver will convert glycogen back into glucose and then the blood glucose level will increase. Okay, so that's how the liver helps to manage the entire blood glucose concentration in the body. Secondly, liver also helps to make proteins. So it uses the amino acids to synthesize proteins it also helps to break apart amino acids like what I mentioned just now. And this process is called deamination. Okay? Not to be confused with what you learned in the previous chapter. It's called denaturation. This is for enzymes. Huh? Okay? So deamination means you break apart the amino acids into urea. Okay? Not denaturation. The third function, the fourth function, sorry, production of bowel. Remember that liver is the one that ultimately produces bowel. And bowel has a role to play. Basically, it emulsifies fats into smaller fatty droplets. And this will actually help to speed up digestion of fats. And it speeds up digestion of fats by this enzyme called the lipase enzyme. Last but not least, the liver actually plays a role in detoxification also. So basically, if you consume harmful substances in your body, like alcohol, for instance, right, the liver actually helps to convert all these harmful substances into harmless products. And it's with the help of this enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Now it converts alcohol into this I mean, another chemical which can be used as a source of energy in the cells. So as what you have mentioned, as what I have mentioned so far, you rest that the liver plays a very, very important role. Be it keeping you healthy, be it for digestive purpose, like to make bowel so that you can speed up digestion, or even to remove harmful substances in the body. That's why there's a need for us to understand what would have happened if alcohol consumption was to be too excessive and it can eventually affect the liver. Now, all of us know that excessive alcohol consumption of alcohol is wrong and it's not healthy because it can increase the risk of gastric ulcers, it can lead to addiction, it can result in reduced self-control and it can slow down some of the brain functions. Right? That's why there's always this advocating, uh, advocation of if you drink, don't drive, so on and so forth. But what is important in this chapter is to understand that alcohol can actually affect the liver and this impact is actually a very, very, very uh, harmful consequences of excessive consumption of alcohol. It's called liver cirrhosis. What exactly is liver cirrhosis? Over here in this picture, right, there's two liver diagrams. One shows a normal liver, one shows a liver with the issue of cirrhosis. 
areas that there's a lot of tiny uh, bumps. This is actually what I call scars. Okay? These are scar rings. So basically, it's like if you fall down, right, and if the scar heals up, there'll be a bump. Otherwise, this liver has went through a lot, a lot of damage because of alcohol consumption. How bad it is? Let's get a video to understand. Alrighty, so what we have here is a, a cross section of a normal liver. There it is on camera. You see how its uh, architecture is relatively intact, the color is relatively homogeneous. Uh, this is. Would you like to hold a normal yeah. liver? There you go. That's a real liver. That's a real liver. Okay. That is somebody's liver. So let's be respectful of that. So this is what a healthy liver should look like. Tara, do you want to hold it? Sure, it's juicy. I get to say I've held a human liver. Yes, you have. Wow. Okay, so that's, again, particularly notice that the architecture is uniform and the, the color and it, there's a homogeneous quality to it, okay? This now is going to be a cirrhotic liver. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and these are all regenerative nodules. The liver is full of scar and it's attempting to regenerate itself, and as it regenerates, it comes up against scar and forms more scar. How long does this take? To develop? Mm -hmm. Well, women are at about a five time greater risk Is of developing this. this. Well, you act, no, it's not the size, it's that you actually lack an enzyme in your stomach to break the alcohol down into a safer compound. And essentially, every woman I've treated that drink like either of you do, has some degree of alcoholic liver disease. It's not possible that you don't have alcoholic liver disease. I can't say that you, don't, that you have cirrhosis, not everybody gets cirrhosis, but I worry that you are at risk for cirrhosis. This is a mess, right? This is somebody, probably somebody who died of cirrhosis. And what happens is that not only are you unable to take toxins out of your system and it can affect your brain and you can become what's called encephalopathic, you can't build proteins normally, you can't fight, your immune system doesn't work normally, blood backs up behind the liver and you actually develop varicose veins in your esophagus, they rupture and you can bleed to death in minutes. As you see in that video, you read that Alcohol consumption is not something to be um, played with. In fact, it can cause a lot of harmful effects before we even know it. Right? So just to take note that this entire uh, chapter does have a very close link to our human diet because we started off by talking about how ingestion happens, how digestion happens, how absorption happens, and eventually we end up with what alcohol can do to our liver. So in a nutshell, this is why you learned this video. You learn about the humanity body bin, why it does. You learn about how assimilation takes place to help you to meet your certain nutrients. And in the end, we end up with how excessive consumption of alcohol can affect you. And with that, we come to the end of this entire chapter on nutrient humans. I hope you had a good time learning through the video lessons. But if you have any doubts, please feel free to check with your teachers. Thank you.